before I even begin, let me, uh, once again, let's just welcome all of you, and most importantly, to the extremely talented Shun Yang Pian on the piano. Thank you for that wonderful prelude. Her performance shows us that our music program is alive and well here at the University of Iowa. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. This program, thank you all for coming. This program was created uh, many, many years ago by James O. Friedman, president of the university, 16th president, who had the inspiration of bringing us together once a year to celebrate the great talent that we have here in a spirit of learning, sharing, collaboration. At the core of the institution, I think those are the principles that bind us. We all live in what I call, jokingly, our home rooms. But actually, a lot of the issues we face are between home rooms. And I think we're going to hear some of that today. Um, it not only showcases the talent that we have here, but also serves to hopefully encourage us to open up our knowledge for the rest of us. Throughout this forum, we have proudly shared our excellence in so many different areas. And it's great to see a number of other uh, prior year recipients here. Uh, we've had recipients speak on their areas of research in physics, astronomy, to the health sciences, literature, music, engineering, law. Last year, uh, we had a wonderful session on climate, climate change. And prior to that, Richard, wherever you are in the room, Richard Pumerton uh, had a wonderful discourse on uh, issues in philosophy. And this year, the 35th Presidential Scholar is E. Dale Abel. And I'm very pleased to now give you some brief, and it's going to take a while to be brief, about his incredible background. You can read the details in the brochure in your hands. He's the Chair and Department Executive Officer of the Department of Internal Medicine. He's a Director of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism in the Department of Internal Medicine. He's a director of the Fraternal Order of Eagles Diabetes Research Center. And all of these are obviously here in our university in the Carver College of Medicine and the UI hospitals and clinics. He is uh, using a sports analogy, perhaps a, a, a triple threat, in that he is a professor of medicine, a professor of biochemistry, and a professor of biomedical engineering. And he holds the John B. Stokes, the third chair in diabetes research, and the Francois M. Aboud, good to see you here, Frank, chair in internal medicine. You're, as I mentioned, your program lists a lot of the other incredibly impressive accomplishments. And I'm not going to repeat that, but we have re reached out to some of the people that he's worked with in the past, some of his mentees, and asked for some of their top of mind thoughts and comments about his mentorship and his research and his practice. And so let me share a few of those with you here for a few moments. Um, he clearly showed great promise early on in his career. His uh, PhD mentor, John Lettingham, emeritus Newfield Professor of Medicine at the University of Oxford, says, and I quote here, Dale was the first Rhodes Scholar in Oxford, at Oxford from Jamaica for many years. And it's quite a distinction. Rhodes Scholars are selected under four criteria. One, literacy and scholastic attainments. Two, energy to use talents to the full, showing truth, courage, devotion to duty. Three, sympathy for and protection of the weak, kindliness, unselfishness, and good fellowship. And four, showing moral force of character and instincts to lead and take interest in fellow human beings. Dale showed all of these. It is a delight to hear of his achievements since leaving Oxford. Clearly, Dale's talents have perished and per, perished, have persisted, have persisted and grown, and we're fortunate to have brought him here to the University of Iowa. As his current colleague, Christopher Adams, professor of internal medicine and fraternal order of eagles and the diabetes research chair says, quote, in addition to being one of the most accomplished and widely respected physician scientists in the world, Dale works tirelessly to make the university an even better place, providing invaluable leadership to the Diabetes Center 
in the Department of Internal Medicine through his boundless energy and enthusiasm and his deep caring for our patients, students, and faculty, end quote. That deep caring is a constant refrain you hear over and over. Many sing Dale Abel's praises from senior colleagues to junior faculty to our students. Renata uh, Pureya, who is the Fraternal Order of Eagles Research Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine, says, quote, over 10 years ago, Dr. Abel generously accepted to host me, then a graduate student from Brazil, whom he did not know, into his laboratory. He welcomed me with open arms, a wide smile, which I soon learned he often wears. <laughs> Dr. Abel's optimism is inspiring, his intelligence is, his intelligence is extraordinary, and his energy is admirable, end quote. Former trainees of Dr. Abel all, all across the country have similar stories to tell. Siam Budina, Bud now with the University of Utah School of Medicine says, quote, Dr. Abel had a tradition to host a potluck at his house every summer. Since his lab was a welcoming place to students and trainees from different nationalities, everyone was supposed to bring a dish that represented his or her country. I remember him trying every single dish after making sure that the dish did not have shellfish because <laughs> Dr. Abel's allergic to shellfish. He tried snakes, <laughs> aged eggs, snails, and did so even when some of them made him ill. <laughs> this speaks of him as an open-minded individual who is willing to take risks, but most of all it shows that Dr. Abel is a culturally informed and sensitive individual." End quote. In 2017, Dr. Abel received the Distinguished Mentor Award from, award from the Iowa Center for Research by undergraduates here at the UI. But this was certainly not his first such award from his students. Adam Wendy, now at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, spearheaded a successful nomination of Dr. Abel for the Distinguished Mentor Award at the University of Utah. Today, Adam says he continues to work with Dr. Abel actively. Quote, his passion for what he does stands out, as well as how he treats his trainees as his extended family. Once you're a colleague, it's a lifelong commitment from Dr. Abel, end quote. Adam notes that Dr. Abel is obviously very engaged intellectually, but he does have a fun side to him. Quote, he is not shy about being the center of the party. At the same time that he can be among the most serious presenters, he can be seen busting a move on the dance floor, <laughs> end quote. Well, I don't know that we're going to see must of the, much of the busting out Dale Abel here today. We might, but I know you're going to see his intellect, his talent, his passion, and dedication on display in his presentation that will be engaging and I'm sure enlightening and inspirational. And who knows, maybe all of us tonight will eat something different than we had <laughs> planned. I'm honored now to produce this year's, introduce this year's presidential lecture, Dr. Dale Abel. Dale. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, President Harold. And um, it looks like you did some espionage and you dug up some of my secrets. And um, I'm glad that certain other ones weren't dug up. Or maybe you have some things that you'll discuss with me afterwards. Um, I, I thought what I'd do this, this, this afternoon is really share with you one of the areas that we have been working on for the last 15 to 20 years, which is really understanding cardiovascular complications of uh, diabetes. Diabetes is an old disease. And the word diabetes actually comes from siphon, because back in the day, the way that you diagnosed diabetes was the patients told you that they had to go to the bathroom to pee a lot. But not only that, um, Back in the day, doctors not only touched patients, but they also tasted bodily fluids. And diabetes mellitus, as shown in that ancient Sanskrit description at the top, um, says the urine was very sweet, cold, sticky, opaque, like the juice of cane sugar. Now, fortunately for many of us, um, we have other tests that we do these days. And we don't necessarily have to submit either ourselves or our patients to that um, level of sampling. 
More recently, Thomas Willis, a distinguished uh, practitioner in the United Kingdom, said diabetic pee tastes wonderfully sweet as if it were imbued with honey or sugar. The story, however, is not that sweet because if one actually looks at the um, prevalence both of obesity, which is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes, as well as type 2 diabetes in the United States, you can see very clearly since um, the, the last 30 years or so, there's been a progressive march in the increase in both the incidence and prevalence of um, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and its major risk factor, obesity. And if one actually looks at that by the numbers, um, you can see um, in the yellow that the percentage of people with diabetes in, in 1960 was approximately 1% of the U.S. population. And now um, in 2015, it's about 20, sorry, it's about 9% um, of the U.S. population. That translates to 25 million individuals with diabetes. It's a global emergency. And if you just stop and look at this slide for a moment, you'll see that every region of the globe is touched by this epidemic. And really, it's an epidemic of development. As we, as humans, have gotten wealthier, more advanced, we eat more, and we see that diabetes then becomes an unfortunate side effect of human development. The other thing I want to note is that if you look at sub-Saharan Africa or the Middle East, the projected increase in incidence of diabetes is actually triple digit. And, and, and therefore, there'll be a shift in the burden of diabetes across the globe, particularly in countries which we would regard now as developing countries. It also costs us a lot. And if you just stop on this slide for a second, you'll see these are denominated in billions of dollars. And you can see, for example, in North America and the Caribbean, which also includes Mexico, that's about $350 billion per year is spent on the care of diabetes. For those of you in the room who might be economists and were probably doing some back-of-the-envelope calculations based on the previous slides, you'll notice that the cost of caring for diabetes in North America, of which the United States is a significant part of that, relative to the rest of the world, is about two or threefold although the number of diabetics in the rest of the world is about two or threefold higher than it is here. I'm not going to give a talk this afternoon about the cost of health care, but I think this slide speaks volumes about the cost of health care, particularly in North America relative to the rest of the world. And one of the reasons why diabetes costs so much is because of its complications. When I was in medical school, I learned that there were two kinds of diabetic complications, what we call microvascular or small vessel complications, or macrovascular or big vessel complications. And microvascular complications cause well-known um, problems such as blindness, actually the commonest cause of blindness, the commonest cause of renal failure, we call that diabetic nephropathy, nerve damage that we call diabetic neuropathy, but the major cause of suffering and ultimately death in people with diabetes is macrovascular complications, which ultimately result in heart attacks and strokes and ultimately uh, heart failure. This slide actually tries to show the extent of the risk of macrovascular disease that occurs in diabetes. And the way that you read this graph is that if you were number one over here, then essentially your risk would not be no greater than the rest of the population. But you can see that irrespective of the cardiovascular complication that was studied, the risk of diabetes increases those by about twofold. Over the last 50 or 60 years, in fact, insulin was discovered almost as a century ago, and over the last 50 or 60 years, we have really had a tremendous increase in the tools and medications that we can use to treat diabetes. And so you'd think that as we have gotten better at treating diabetes, then many of the complications should have also um, been reduced. So let me first address the first question. How well have we been doing in treating diabetes? And the way that you interpret this um, graph is that this is plotting something called the hemoglobin A1c, which is a measure of long-term diabetes control. And if the number is less than seven, then we are doing a good job in treating your diabetes. So from the 1980s to the first part of this century, about 77% versus 60% had blood glucose levels within the range of less than 7% of the hemoglobin A1c. So if one then looks at the complication rates in terms of cardiovascular disease, 
On the left-hand side, you see a plot looking at patients with diabetes and looking at acute myocardial infarction, stroke, amputations, or renal failure from 1990 to 2010. And you can see that there has been a nice reduction in stroke and heart attacks over this period of time. So the question then is this cause for celebration. So look very closely at the y-axis. This is looking at the number of events per 10,000 of the adult population amongst people with diabetes. In the general population, you can see that whereas with improvement, there are probably 75 to 50 events per 10,000, in the rest of the population, it's 6 to 8. So despite the improvement, there's still a 7 to 8-fold increased risk of cardiovascular disease in people with diabetes, despite the fact that we are doing a better job of getting blood sugar under better control. So the question then is, um, why, why might we be, in fact, missing the mark? I can take anybody who's a patient, and I suspect there's probably nobody in this room who doesn't at least know somebody who has diabetes. And with effort and charm and counseling and everything, I can probably get your blood sugar down. But I'm not sure if I will prevent you from having a cardiovascular event. And I will try and explain to you why that might be the case. So in the context of overnutrition, which drives the epidemic of type 2 diabetes, multiple things occur in individuals, summarized here. So not only do people become hyperglycemic, which is a nice medical term for having elevated blood sugars, but they also get lipid abnormalities. They get hypertensive, which is associated with insulin resistance. They get whole body inflammation. Their blood is a little thicker. That's called impaired fibrinolysis. Their blood vessels don't behave. We call it endothelial dysfunction. And all of these changes really conspire towards amplifying the risk of vascular disease. Therefore, if one only treats one of those squares, you can see very easily that you may not necessarily have the impact on vascular disease that you think you'd have by just lowering or normalizing the levels of um, blood glucose. This has actually been studied very well over the last 20 years or so in terms of what reduces complications of diabetes. So with regards to microvascular complications, there is no doubt that normalizing blood glucose will in fact reduce retinopathy or blindness and will ultimately reduce the risk of renal failure. However, with regards to macrovascular disease, you'll see that treating blood pressure and lipids in diabetics probably has a bigger effect on macrovascular disease than lowering blood sugar. And I'm not advocating that I shouldn't lower your blood sugar, but what I'm saying is that that may in fact not be enough. The other conundrum that we have is that when we have done studies where we have taken individuals with type 2 diabetes and aggressively lowered their blood sugar and asked the question, do they live longer or do they have less cardiovascular disease? The answer has been no. This slide summarizes a series of landmark trials that attempted to address that question. So again, the way to read this is that if you fall to the left of this line, then tight control of diabetes is a good thing. If you fall to the right of this line, tight control of your type 2 diabetes is not a good thing. And in fact, if you look at all-cause mortality, it trends to the right. If you look at cardiovascular death, it also trends to the right. When the FDA saw this, they therefore mandated that every trial for every new diabetic drug that had to be approved not only had to show that it lowers blood glucose, had to also show it didn't kill people. And more importantly, had to show it had at least a neutral or potentially a positive cardiovascular benefit. This slide summarizes the plethora of clinical trials which are now ongoing. They all have nice names like TCUS and Sustain and Excel and Freedom from CVD. That's sort of the joy of clinical trials. You, have, you spend half your time putting a name on the trial. Um, but some of these have now actually completed enrollment and have actually shown that with some of these newer agents, they're, at least many are, are neutral and a few of them have some benefit. But the overall message here is that they all lower blood glucose to the same extent, but the effect on cardiovascular disease doesn't necessarily match the degree of blood lowering. 
So we have this black box scenario, which is, well, what else is in the black box that, that we are not really addressing when we try to manage individuals with diabetes? So I'm about to make you all endocrinologists on this slide. We all make insulin, and after this lecture, I know some of us are going to have a meal, and you're probably all going to have supper. And um, assuming that your pancreas is healthy, you will increase your levels of insulin because you need to get the blood glucose down, you need to get the sugar into various organs. Where? Into muscle, as glycogen, into liver. And then you also have to take the excess that you can't store otherwise and convert it into fat. And insulin does all of those things. Now, in the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes, what occurs is that there's a phenomenon known as insulin resistance, which is to say that tissues that normally respond to insulin do not respond as well to insulin. So what that means, if you're a liver, is that whereas insulin tells the liver to stop making glucose, if the liver becomes insulin resistant, it says, nah, I'll just keep making glucose. If your fat cells become insulin resistant, then they'll say, I won't store fat, but I'm going to do the opposite. It's called lipolysis. It's the breaking down of fat. I'm going to push that back into the circulation. And if the muscles become insulin resistant, then they will not take up glucose as they're supposed to. And as a consequence of that, you then get this abnormal metabolic milieu because the pancreas tries to make more insulin to overcome the block. So insulin levels rise. Fat cells are pushing fat out, so levels of fats in the blood rise. And of course, as we know, levels of glucose rises. And it gets even a little bit more complicated than that, because not only does that start the process, but ultimately, other things occur. There's increased inflammation which occurs, which leads to the production of molecules called cytokines, which are mediators of inflammation, which ultimately can also drive vascular disease. So let me tell you a little bit about atherosclerosis, which is a condition um, associated with the blockage of arteries by plaques, which are full of cholesterol. And this cartoon here shows a narrowing artery laden with cholesterol about to be occluded that will then present to the emergency room with a heart attack or potentially with a stroke. This is a cartoon of the, a blood vessel. This is the lining of the blood vessel. It's called endothelial cells. And these are cells called monocytes, which ultimately become inflammatory cells called macrophages. And in the context of diabetes, as the endothelium is responding to this abnormal metabolic milieu, it activates these cells, which then roll along these cells and ultimately squeeze in between them to an area of the vessel beneath these cells. And there they meet lots of cholesterol. They have a feast. They load up on cholesterol and it gradually forms a plaque. That's how atherosclerosis occurs. It turns out that if you're hyperglycemic, then this process is accelerated. So you're sort of putting fuel on the fire. And for those of you who are signaling cognoscenti in the room, you recognize certain signaling pathways on this slide which are activated in the context of hyperglycemia. But I mentioned as well that in insulin resistance, you become hyperinsulinemic as well. And when you treat hyperglycemia, say with insulin, you're actually bringing insulin levels up to do that. And that there are certain cellular pathways, again summarized here for the cognizante in the room, that activate signaling processes that makes these macrophages a little bit angry and will, in fact, lead to their increased migration into the vessel wall. And as it grows, you get what we call this necrotic plaque, which ultimately will rupture and, and cause a thrombosis. Now, our lab got interested recently in studying one small aspect of this, which are um, cells called platelets. So platelets are these tiny cell fragments that are absolutely critical for the thrombotic process. So if you cut yourself, it stops bleeding. You thank your platelets for that. And it turned out that when I was, we were still in Utah, a friend of mine um, said, who was upstairs who studied platelets, I, had not, I did not study platelets at all. I'm an endocrinologist. I study hormones and diabetes and glands, not platelets. But he said, the NIH is coming up with a request for applications, and they want to understand why does diabetes make platelets more sticky. 
And a former mentor of me said there was an RFA that I would never go out on a date with. So RFA is a request for applications. So we talked about it for a while, and he said, you know, I have some evidence that this little cell fragment here called a platelet actually misbehaves in the context of diabetes. Why don't we study this together? So I'm going to give you a very brief um, story of one piece of this work that was done by Trevor Fiddler, who um, was a graduate student and is now a postdoc at Columbia University in New York. So that's an electron micrograph of, of a platelet. And you can see that in, a, in the quiet state, it's a st uh, this circular blob of cytoplasm with a few things in it. These granules have vasoactive substances. This is an activated platelet. It's angry. It's sticking things out. It's looking to grab onto something else. It wants to form a mesh. It wants things to stick to it. It wants to form a clot. And the premise of that project was that the abnormal metabolic milieu that I just introduced you to reprograms the cells in the bone marrow called megakaryocytes that then break off these little fragments called platelets. Now, this is cell biology 101. Most cells have membranes which are complex lipid bilayers. That's the outside of the cell, and this is the inside the cell. And these membranes are relatively impervious to soluble stuff. And so the question then is, how do you take a platelet that's circulating in, in the body in the context, say, of hyperglycemia, and how does glucose actually get inside the platelets? So that was, that was one question. And it turns out that one of the things I studied very early on in my training was a phenomenon known as glucose transport. And glucose enters cells via specific proteins known as glucose transporters that will recognize the glucose on the outside of the cell, form a pore in the cell membrane that will then bring glucose inside the cell. And like many of us, we are from maybe big families, and there's a large family of glucose transport proteins, group 1 through 12. Again, scientists are simple people, so we just name things by adding another number to them. And as they were discovered, we just said 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And there are two glucose transport proteins in platelets, specifically GLUT1 and GLUT3. So we used a clever genetic engineering trick to actually make platelets that lacked GLUT1 and GLUT3, but only in platelets. And what Trevor was able to show, and I'll just give you a couple of pieces of data here. This is a Western blot showing that in mice that lack GLUT1, we call them GLUT1 knockouts, there's no GLUT1 protein. Mice that lack GLUT3, there's no GLUT3 protein. And then we cross them together to get these double knockouts, DKOs, and they have no GLUT1 or GLUT3. You can measure the glucose uptake in these cells, and you can see that if you try to activate these platelets in a dish, that normal cells will increase their glucose uptake when they're activated, but these GLUT1, 3 double knockout platelets um, do not take up any glucose. So we have a model that works. So what happens to how the blood clots? So you can try to activate platelets in a dish. You can give a drug, in this case thrombin, and you can measure a, a protein on the surface, and you can see that in normal platelets, there is this appearance of this protein on the surface. If the platelets cannot use glucose, there is less of this protein. So these platelets are a little bit sleepy. You can also just take an animal, and you can put a little biopsy of its tail and stick it in some warm saline and just get a stopwatch and ask, how long does it take for the bleeding to stop? And you can see that in normal mice, it stops in about a minute. In these animals that do not have the glucose transport, it takes a little bit longer. You can also expose one of the arteries and put a little bit of iron chloride on there. And with a probe, measure blood flow. This will irritate the lining on the, the, it'll form a clot in that blood vessel. And again, you can see that the normal vessel will occlude in about 500 seconds, but the ones that don't use glucose will actually take a bit longer. So what this taught us then was that the field had known very well that there was a, a very exquisite signaling pathway that was required for activating platelets, but it had to be fueled by glucose. So Trevor then asked the question, so we have a model that doesn't use glucose. Let's make these animals diabetic and ask what happens. 
And the way that you do that um, in the lab is that you can give a drug that damages the beta cells of the pancreas, and these animals will become hyperglycemic. So this is a blood sugar curve over time, and the gray, and gray squares and black circles on the bottom are animals that got no drug, and the animals that got the drug to make them diabetic are shown here. And you can see that their blood sugar rises very nicely, but the controls and the mutant animals, they get the same degree of diabetes. So there's no difference in the degree of hyperglycemia. What then happened to how much sugar their platelets use? So focus here on this black and red bar, and you can see that a diabetic platelet uses about twice as much sugar than a non-diabetic platelet. And then this is what happens when you push them and fully activate them. And over here, a business slide, but again, focus on the black and red bars, and we're essentially activating platelets in a dish by exposing them to this compound, PAR4. And you can again see that the diabetic platelets are angry. They're easy to activate. And when we impair their ability to, to use glucose, they are less angry. They activate less well. So you can do things with approval of the animal facility and the IA cook and so forth to actually ask the question, can you do something in vivo to see if there's a survival advantage? And there is something that you can do where you can actually inject an animal with collagen and epinephrine, and it gets massive pulmonary embolism, which is driven by increased blood clots in the lung. So we did this both to diabetic animals and non-diabetic animals with and without the ability to use glucose in their platelets. This is a survival curve. The black line are control animals who, who have been treated to induce this pulmonary embolism, and they die rather rapidly. If they are diabetic, they die faster. If their platelets are not able to use glucose, which is in the blue, they actually have a survival advantage. So what this therefore taught us was that overfeeding platelets in the context of diabetes with glucose actually overactivates them and increases the risk of thrombosis as occurs in the context of diabetes. The second complication I'm going to talk about in, in, the, in, in this lecture is heart failure. You may remember from the very first slide I showed you, I talked about microvascular and macrovascular complications, talked about blindness, renal failure, neuropathy, and heart attacks and strokes. Heart failure is another relatively unrecognized diabetic complication, and let me show you the evidence for that. This is a large epidemiological study. And what this is showing is either the prevalence or the incidence of heart failure in individuals with diabetes across the age spectrum. So starting at less than age 45, going up to 100 years old. And at every age point, the number of heart failure events are significantly higher in individuals with diabetes. And very interestingly, when they did an analysis of this epidemiological study, there are a few things that showed that, that correlated with this risk of diabetes. For example, ischemic heart disease, renal failure. But intriguingly, female sex increased their risk of heart failure for diabetic. We actually don't know why, and this is a very important area, I think, for further study. And we have been very interested in this one, which is insulin use. Now, you could say that if you are taking insulin, you have more severe diabetes, and that's simply the reason why. And although I won't speak about this in this lecture, we have direct evidence that once the heart begins to fail, increased insulin signaling on the heart can, in fact, accelerate heart failure. I also mentioned earlier that if you look at the general population, 9 to 10% of the general population are diabetic. If you look at the heart failure population, so people in the hospital with heart failure, and in this study done by uh, Justin Achu for Chaga at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, they looked at nearly 400,000 heart failure admissions using Medicare data and asked the question, what percentage of them were diabetic? And they looked at different kinds of heart failure, and irrespective of the kind of heart failure, and for the cognoscenti, this is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction versus heart failure with reserved ejection fraction, almost 50% of heart failure patients had diabetes. This is a survival graph. And if you look at this very carefully, you'll see 
Breast cancer, 11% mortality, five years. Lymphoma, 15% mortality at five years. Colon cancer, 35%. Leukemia, heart failure, 48% mortality at five years. It is a devastating disorder. And if you're a diabetic and you have heart failure, the outcome is actually quite substantially worse. So it then begs the question, um, what's driving this heart failure, and is it glucose? And if it is glucose, what happens if we lower glucose, and what, what does that do on the prevalence or incidence of heart failure? So this is another slide, just again, you're used to these now, which is looking at the relationship between blood glucose control and heart failure risk. And again, if you're on this line of one, it means that there's no increased risk. And basically, for every percentage increase in hemoglobin A1c, there's an increase in the risk of heart failure with the exception of one study. And I'm going to summarize in this slide essentially what we have learned from studies looking at multiple diabetes therapies. That many of the ones that we've been using for a very long time, shown here on the left, if you look at the impact on heart failure, there's actually no real benefit, despite the fact that they lower blood sugar very effectively. There are some new agents. Well, there's actually one very old agent here, metformin, which for those in the room, like Dr. Abud, who have been practicing medicine before I was born, um, he was probably prescribing metformin back in the day. And it actually has a very positive effect on the heart. And there's certain, some new medications coming out now that may also do the same. So the question then is, why is this? And this is a busy slide, and I just put it there just to say it's complicated that there are multiple pathways that ultimately impinge upon the heart in the context of diabetes to increase the risk of heart failure. And we have studied a few of these in the lab, and I'm going to give you a brief story about two things, mitochondria and a phenomenon known as um, lipotoxicity. These are MRIs that were actually obtained at the University of Iowa of the human heart. That's a healthy heart. That's a failing heart. I'm sorry. Let's go back. Let's use my clicker here. Right, that's a failing heart. And I'm gonna, I'll put this on again. You can see the healthy heart is squeezing very nicely. The failing heart is not squeezing so nicely. And at some point, the loop stops and the heart stops. That's not actually good when the heart stops, right? Because the heart is a muscular pump that pumps thousands of gallons of blood throughout our lifetime. It doesn't have the, the option to take a rest. It doesn't have the option to fatigue. And the way that the heart is able to maintain this level of activity over decades of life is because it is exquisitely adapted to make fuel called ATP, which is the fuel that drives the contraction of cardiac muscle. So I must talk a little bit about metabolism, because that's how you make ATP. And this is a cartoon of the heart, kind of blown up. And on the outside, you see glucose and fatty acids, which are the favorite food of the heart. And it takes these into the cells, and there it undergoes a series of metabolic processes. For glucose, it's called glycolysis. For fatty acids, it's called beta oxidation. And it breaks down into smaller and smaller molecules that ultimately will enter the mitochondria and will go through something called the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle. And Hans Krebs was a professor at Oxford um, whose last PhD student, Heinrich Teitmer, is a personal friend of mine. So he tells me all these wonderful stories of his time in Dr. Krebs's lab, for which he won the Nobel Prize, of understanding how these small molecules are broken down in the mitochondria to ultimately fuel what's called the electron transport chain to make ATP. The normal human heart weighs about 350 grams. That heart generates up to six to eight kilograms of ATP per day. And it burns all of it in order to maintain its need to constantly, constantly contract. So we studied diabetic animals, and this is an OB-OB mouse. It has a mutation in a gene called leptin, and it makes it eat a lot. It overeats, and it becomes obese and diabetic. These are his little mates, so they're the same age, who don't have the mutation. And um, this one is diabetic. Those two are not. 
We have a heart-lung machine in the lab. We can actually take these hearts out of these animals, hook them up to the heart-lung machine, and they beat. And I'll probably put it again because it's actually a fun video. But these things beat, and they, they will tell us things. We can actually measure how much they metabolize. And you can see in this graph here is that if you take a diabetic heart shown in the black bars and you compare them to a non-diabetic heart shown in the white bars, there is a difference in metabolism. Diabetic hearts actually metabolize less glucose, as shown here, but metabolize more fat. And in fact, if you then look at how much work these hearts are doing, they are doing less work. But interestingly, they're using more oxygen to do less work. So at this point, I'll give my marathon runner analogy. So if I'm a marathon runner, and Dean Jackson is here, and I know Dean Jackson runs, um, and if I put him in a box where I'm measuring his oxygen consumption, and then maybe I have him run with President Harold, <laughs> I suspect that after 100 yards, or however long we do the experiment, you're gonna use less oxygen because you run all the time. And I would encourage you to run some more, President Harold. Um, and so the point of this is, is that somebody's really efficient. Somebody might be less efficient in converting oxygen to energy. And the diabetic heart is the same thing. It's a less efficient heart. And in fact, we can calculate cardiac efficiency. You can see very clearly that cardiac efficiency is reduced in the diabetic heart. Now, why is this? This occurs because mitochondria, which are those little parts of the cell that make ATP, are abnormal in the diabetic heart. So this is an image that we published a few years ago from um, a normal heart or a type 1 diabetic heart. This is an animal image. There are similar images in humans. And you can see clearly that this looks different from that. So a healthy mitochondria has all of these structures called Christi that are very densely packed inside its structure. And in the diabetic mitochondria, you can see somebody took a hairdryer or, or an airbrush, kind of blew things up, out a little bit. They are less Christy, and in fact, these mitochondria are making less ATP. Another type of diabetic model, you can, again, can see the pattern of mitochondria are different from the normal, and these yellow arrows are showing lipid droplets, which are also accumulating in the hearts of these animals. So as we began to study this, there are many tools that we can use to address the question as to why are we, what's the basis for this mitochondrial um, impairment? And one of the things that one can do is do something called proteomics, where you measure the levels of almost every protein in the cell. And one of the things that we saw very early on was that the proteins involved in this part of glucose metabolism called glycolysis were reduced, but the proteins involved in fat metabolism are actually induced or increased. But at the same time, the proteins in the mitochondria were reduced. So you had this sort of metabolic imbalance where you're pushing all the, the, the fat in, but you didn't have the capacity in the mitochondria to actually burn this fat very efficiently. And so you might be asking, and I'm, I think lots of Buddha's asking this question, well, if the mitochondria are sick, why are they using more oxygen? Because a healthy mitochondria will use a lot of oxygen to make ATP. You think a sick mitochondria would not use oxygen to make ATP. And I remind you again of the, of the oxygen graph I showed you before, that the diabetic hearts are kind of blowing hard, using a lot of oxygen. And this is also true in people. So this is actually a study in diabetic humans um, showing oxygen consumption in their hearts um, as a function. Here, this is um, body mass index, but they were also more diabetic. And cardiac efficiency shown here that these individuals also had less efficiency in their heart and more oxygen consumption. So here's the answer. We are giving too much fat to the heart. We're delivering what we call reducing equivalents, which are the building blocks that drives ATP synthesis. But the mitochondria, the machinery, which we call oxidative phosphorylation or OxFos, is decreased. And an unfortunate side effect of this imbalance is the overproduction of a pesky molecule called reactive oxygen species or ROS. This is, I promise, the only biochemistry slide I will show in this talk. But I, I think this is important. If, and if, if you get this, then I feel I've done a really good job. This is a mitochondria. 
This is fatty acids, this is glucose. They enter the mitochondria's acetyl-CoA, and when they push reducing equivalence to the electron transport chain, this molecular machine pumps protons into this space called the intermembrane space. That's the charge that drives the battery. Because when these protons then re-enter the matrix through this other protein called ATP synthase, it takes that energy on the charge and converts it to ATP. Now, when the proton gets in the matrix, it has to be taken care of, and it actually interacts with molecular oxygen to form water. So when we measure oxygen consumption in mitochondria, we're essentially measuring this process by which these protons are crossing and re-entering the, the mitochondrial matrix. It turns out that ROS activates other proteins to make them leaky. And so they will leak these protons instead of ATP. And so you have a scenario where you're using oxygen, but because you're bypassing ATP synthase, then you're making less ATP. And that's the basis for the reduction in cardiac efficiency in diabetes, which our lab discovered. Very recently, we also showed that not only does this ROS affect oxygen use by um, platelets, um, by, by mitochondria in the heart, I'm sorry, but um, in work done by Kensuke Tsushima, who's a postdoc with me, he's now a, a professor at the University of Tokyo, that he studied another feature of mitochondria, which is kind of cute. So mitochondria have DNA, and mitochondria, like us, we like to meet people. We like to fuse and share our DNA. And um, occasionally we break up. And so that process by which mitochondria meet each other and fuse is called mitochondrial fusion. Again, science is not rocket science. And then the process by which the mitochondria break up is called mitochondrial fission. And what Kensuke showed very nicely in the paper just published was that if we looked at the animal model that was using too much fat in their hearts, this is a PET scan of a mouse showing fatty acid oxidation, and this is a diabetic model where you can see a lot more fat going into the heart. What he showed very nicely was that the mitochondria changed their shape. And I'll just show you a blow up of this here, um, which you can see that these are normal mitochondria. And in this particular model, you can see this really gives the impression of spaghetti. And we got this image by kind of putting on a virtual headset, because when you do an electron micrograph, you're seeing it in two dimensions. But if you do a three-dimensional um, approach to electron microscopy, you can actually get a sense for what's happening in, in multiple planes to the shape of the mitochondria. And what he showed very nicely was that this phenomenon was also driven by ROS, that as these mitochondria began, began to twist and turn, that that also correlated with a change in function. And in fact, what he also showed, as summarized here, was that if you scavenge ROS by overexpressing an enzyme that sucks it up like a sponge, the mitochondria got bigger. And if you use more fat, the mitochondria got smaller and more spaghetti-like. And therefore, without going into too much detail, we showed very nicely that we identified the molecular events that were being impacted by ROS, which were then linked to proteins known to regulate mitochondria shape and size. This actually got a fair amount of press, and this is just one little press thing that somebody drew in the last few weeks on this article. But summarized, I think, very nicely, was that this work really showed that too much fat for the diabetic heart might, in fact, increase the risk of heart failure. So I'm going to end with the glucose in the heart very briefly. And just to make the overall point that although I showed you earlier that the heart actually completely oxidizes less glucose, the glucose is kind of piling in at the top. So what happens to all of that stuff that's actually not oxidized? And it actually causes trouble. And I'll show you a very nice example of how that is. Rebecca Alton reed is an MD, PhD student in our lab. And we have collaborated with Ken Margulies at the University of Pennsylvania. And Ken has the largest tissue heart bank in the country. And the way it works is that when people are listed for heart transplantation, they are donors and occasionally the hearts are not used and therefore they get archived and stored. And then when individuals who are recipients of heart transplants have the old heart taken out, it's also banked and stored. So we said, Ken, we want a number of hearts because we want people 
about the same age. We want people who are overweight. We want people who are diabetic or non-diabetic. And you can see at the bottom here that individuals with heart failure had reduced ejection fractions. Um, but importantly, what we did in, in, the, in these samples was that we did another kind of um, process where we can measure the concentrations of all the small molecules in the cell to actually ask what's up, what's down. And we call that metabolomics. So we did that um, in some of these heart samples. And in fact, what Yuan Zhang, who's a postdoc in the lab, was able to show was that we had this accumulation of what we call these glycolytic intermediates, but a reduction in the molecules in the mitochondria. And not only that, we got all these side changes branching off that are not what would happen normally, but you get some interesting molecules like D-galactose, mannose, sorbitol, which are piling up in these failing hearts, suggesting that the glucose is not being completely metabolized and all of these metabolic intermediates are now backing up. And this is important because some of these metabolites, like mannose, for example, ultimately leads to complications in the tissue, like called protein glycation, where the glucose actually kind of starts to form scars and increases fibrosis. Um, sorbitol actually depletes certain enzymes and leads to something called oxidative stress. And galactose leads to inflammation in these tissues. So we'd like to have fun in the lab, and we said, okay, we have this observation. Can we model this in a mouse? So we made a mouse that had glycolytic backup, and we did that by inhibiting a protein that takes pyruvate into mitochondria. And when we did that, we got nice backup of all these things. And interestingly, when we hung those hearts and measured metabolism, they did what diabetic hearts do. They oxidize more fat, use less glucose, and use more oxygen. And in fact, they fail. So these are the mutant hearts here after a few months. They are big, they are dilated, they're not squeezing very well. And we can measure that here as ejection fraction. You can see it's rather low. So just causing a backup of all of these poorly metabolized glucose intermediates was sufficient in this animal model to lead the heart to fail. So this cartoon drawn by Adam Wende, who you spoke with, and who told me about my dance moves. Um, Adam sent me this slide because he has taken a part of this work with him in his own lab at the University of Alabama. And in some different models, he has also shown that by pushing more glucose into the heart, you get accumulation not only of glycogen as you'd expect, but other bypass um, pathways like hexosamines, which he has shown very nicely, leads to molecules that bind to DNA, leads to molecules that bind to the electron transport chain, and ultimately will lead both to the altered expression of genes as well as altered function of the mitochondria. So I'm going to end us with a cute experiment, and then we wrap this up. So if you have a heart that is not able to completely oxidize sugar, can you fool it and give it something else to eat? And by having it eat something else, then can you have it not worry about pulling all this glucose in? So we gave these mice an Atkins diet, and it's, it's, it's a ketogenic diet, high in fat. Um, this one was actually relatively low in protein, but very, very low in carbs. And we said, let's feed you, feed you this diet. Let's give you lots of ketones to eat and see if that will make you happy. And it turns out it made these hearts very happy. It's a busy slide, but just, just focus here on this thing called EF, or ejection fraction. And so the mutants are failing on, a, on the diet. They preserve their function they have less hypertrophy as shown here. So what I tried to do in my talk today is just to give you a, a broad sense of some of the, of the complexities that the poor heart has to deal with in the context of the diabetic milieu. And Adam also shared with this slide, which is in the context of heart failure in diabetes, it's really death by a thousand cuts. And I've showed you some evidence this, this evening of the role of abnormal lipids on the mitochondria I showed you some evidence of incomplete metabolism of glucose and effects that that might have on the heart. We are, we are actively studying the effects of insulin, which I won't tell you about, and other labs are studying the effects of inflammation um, in the heart. So ultimately, as we really try to tackle this really potentially difficult problem of heart failure in diabetes, where we need to go next, I believe, is not just simply lowering the blood sugar, 
we really need to understand what's happening within the cells and identify targets that potentially we can then modify in, in, in new ways. I can stand here this evening because I'm really privileged to work with an amazing team of individuals. This is a picture for a lab over in the Papa John building. And you see many faces, and it ranges from undergraduate students to graduate students to postdoc students, medical students, and junior faculty. I've put on listed here um, colleagues who have worked with me on the specific projects I told you about over the years, many of whom are now running their own labs in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. And it takes a large village to do this kind of work. And I've been really very fortunate to have had a large number of collaborators, again, across the country and across the world, who have been very generous in terms of sharing skills, ideas, and reagents to have allowed us to do some of this work. I feel extremely fortunate to be here at the University of Iowa. And I put the picture of the Papa John building there on the right to remind me to say that the idea of moving to Iowa from the mountains of Utah wasn't necessarily an easy one. Um, that said, I managed to convince my whole lab to move. And we've really had a wonderful go at it over the last um, four and a half years. And I've been fairly fortunate to have maintained some funding to keep this going. So I thank you very much for this tremendous honor and privilege to um, deliver this lecture this afternoon. I hope I haven't bored you too much or overwhelmed you with too much biochemistry. But um, I certainly want you to enjoy your supper tonight. Don't feel too guilty about what you eat, but I would strongly recommend loading up on the vegetables and maybe cutting back a little bit on the carbs. Thank you very much. So I believe there's some time for a few questions, if anybody would like to ask one or two. Yes? For people without diabetes, does overeating affect the heart in any significant way? That's a very good question. So um, if you look at individuals um, who are obese but not yet diabetic, you do see some similar changes in, in, in cardiac um, substrate metabolism. So the idea of increased fatty acid use um, decreased efficiency of the heart also holds true in people who are pre-diabetic. There's also evidence if you just take perfectly healthy people and you sort of force feed them like for a week on, in various kinds of diets, you can actually see very significant changes in, in heart metabolism, which you can measure by NMR um, imaging approaches. Um, so, you know, some people say you are what you eat, and the heart um, really believes that. Yes, Andy. The uh, SGLT, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors, how do you think they're affecting the heart? So, or do you think the same sure. Heart screening? So what Dr. Norris has asked, there, there's a, a brand new class of diabetic drugs called SGLT2 inhibitors. And they work essentially by blocking a particular protein in the kidney that would ordinarily reabsorb glucose. And so in a sense, it makes you pee out more glucose, which for an endocrinologist, is like an anathema because if you're a diabetic, you're already peeing out glucose, and there's a new drug that makes you pee out more glucose. But with that said, there was a landmark trial that was done um, last year, in fact, with two different members of this class that showed very impressive cardiovascular benefit and very um, impressive reduction in heart failure incidence. So, you're, so the question then is, how does it work? Um, we don't really know, but I'll tell you a few of the theories, and some of these are actually testing. One is that people who are taking this medication do actually have slightly higher levels of ketones in their blood. And I know I showed you a little story at the end where if you overfed a heart ketones, it actually may do better in some way. So that's one theory. Um, some of these patients have slightly lower blood pressure. And so people think it may just be a, a combination of blood pressure and less blood volume that might also be contributing to this. We really don't know at this point. I suspect also that these agents may have other to be determined effects on the heart that might also be contributing to this benefit. Yes. Right, so the question is, 
you know, is the modest weight loss um, in those trials having an effect? So I can't speak to that, but I can definitely speak a little bit about weight loss, whether it's modest or, 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 or not. There's tremendous evidence um, epidemiologically that even losing 10 to 15% of your body weight if you are obese and diabetic can have profound positive benefits on a number of cardiovascular risk factors. So um, again, the mechanisms are complex, but clearly um, pushing back the, the weight health curve, which has unfortunately has shifted a little bit far in a way that we don't want it to go, I think will have um, significant long-term effects. And again, you don't need huge effects to have large effects on, on, on large numbers of individuals. Yes, Moni. Right, so you're correct, particularly well. So I think in the platelets, it's not so clear. I think that if you, remember, I showed you an experiment in an extreme model where I essentially prevented these platelets from using any glucose at all. I mean, in reality, I could never do, it, do that with a drug, right? Um, but as far as the, the heart is concerned, I think the problem is this, that even if you lower the glucose levels to normal, but you do not fix the mitochondria, then you will still have this impaired metabolism and this accumulation of these byproducts of glucose metabolism. So ultimately what we need to do is that we need to improve, I think, from a, a metabolic perspective, improve the ability of the mitochondria to completely oxidize the food it gets. And if we can do that, and then potentially we might then begin to see fewer of those effects which occur when you have these molecules doing things that they weren't really meant to ultimately do. Yeah, so quite, a few, so quite a few groups are actually studying this now. So if you look in, in the literature broadly, um, ketogenic diets have been linked to increased lifespan, increased health span, decreasing the risk of diabetes. When I speak to people who are on these diets, they feel lousy because the ketones are kind of like, you know, pickling your brain, as it were. Um, and, and so, you know, I suspect the compliance is not going to be, not going to be high with, with this approach. I think what we're trying to learn, though, is what are ketones doing? Um, and if we can understand that, then maybe we can do something to mimic that. Um, but I, I suspect that the compliance will be an issue with many of these diets in terms of a, a, a long-term therapy. I have a friend from Oxford who, um, Karen Clark, who was a, was a professor who actually studied this a lot and you know, forms a, formed a company. It's called Delta G. So if you study mitochondria, Delta G is a particular measure of mitochondrial energetics. And she actually knows manufacturing ketones. Um, and she's working on the flavoring and everything. She had actually a big DOD grant to do this. And the idea is um, you can actually take it as a, like a, a ketone shake. And I'll just tell you one other quick story in that regard. So she published a paper in Athletes these are cyclers, and they kind of loaded up on this before. They did better. It hit the web, right? So if you type in ketones and performance, you will see all sorts of products that are now being um, marketed to promote um, endurance. Is there any effects, uh, or is there a point where you get to where the effects on the heart are irreversible? Yes. So the question is, are there, is there a point at which the effects could be irreversible? I, I think that's... True. We don't fully understand how to, how to kind of reverse, remodel a failing heart. Because remember that when a heart begins to fail, not only are you getting increased like fibrosis and scarring, but you are also losing cardiac muscle cells, which do not have tremendous ability to regenerate. So I think there, there probably is a point at which it's very difficult to bring it back. That said, um, certainly in animal models, we can bring things back from far, from, 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 from quite a ways. And um, we are involved in a project with um, colleagues at Utah where there's a small subset of patients with heart failure who do go on something called left ventricular assist device, which is a bridge to transplantation. About five or 10% of them fully recover and come off these devices. And we actually have a grant with them to study 
that because we think there might be a, a metabolic reason for that. So it's a long answer to your question, but I would say there is a, a fairly narrow window where you can reverse things. Um, I think when you go to the extreme, it's probably a little bit too late. And so if nothing else, we need to prevent and we need to treat early. Sure. Right. So ACE inhibitors, as, as many of you know, are you know, a cornerstone of treating heart failure. And they work very well, whether you have diabetes or not. So there, there is no difference in efficacy of these agents, whether you're diabetic with heart failure or not. So that will remain a cornerstone of the treatment of these individuals. Um, there's also evidence, for example, that people on ACE inhibitors, say for hypertension, for example, actually are somewhat protected from becoming diabetic over time. Um, again, multiple mechanisms why that might be the case. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. So again, you know, I think you've raised a very important issue. So the question, if you didn't hear it over the other in the room, was what is, you know, what is the, my perspective on the importance of prevention? Because you could say if we could sort of roll back our caloric intake to what was happening in the 50s or 60s, right, then maybe my endocrine colleagues in this room might be out of work, at least as far as type 2 diabetes is concerned. And and so, yes, I mean, this is a, a social thing. If you look, in fact, at the relationship between laws that um, subsidized corn and got high fructose corn syrup pretty much in everything that we eat, and the other unfortunate part of this, at least in, in, in North America, was that for probably two decades, fat was bad. And so what food manufacturers did was that they just switched the calories from fat to, to glucose or high fructose corn syrup to, to maintain the flavor. And it turns out that that was probably even worse than keeping some level of healthy fats in the food. So, so there is, you know, we need to work with the food manufacturers. We need to make healthy food, and I'm not sort of waxing political here. We need to, to make healthy foods affordable because food which is not so healthy is actually pretty inexpensive. And if you actually look at the relationship, for example, between poverty and diabetes, it's actually directly correlated, and, it's, and the correlation occurs in the context of availability of inexpensive, dense, highly caloric foods. That's one point. Then the second point has to do with sort of public policy around how you get from point A to point B. Right, I could show you lots of cartoons of you know, people driving through and having their meal delivered on their lap. Um, and you know, the, the, the notion of having us actually walk more, be more physically active, um, is something that I think needs to be thought about and needs to be discussed in the context of urban planning, et cetera, because there's a direct correlation between an increasing sedentary lifestyle plus caloric excess and the exploding prevalence of type 2 diabetes that we're seeing. So yes, prevention is absolutely critical. I think it's going to need a lot more than us asking for it. It's going to need appropriate public policy and investment in really um, tractable solutions to this. Yes. So the question is, um, he's been taking fish oil supplements for the last 20 years. So I'm giving him a free consult here. Um, there, so not all fat is bad. And I think it's important to make that point very clear. Um, and um, fish oils um, are rich in certain polyunsaturated fatty acids. And you know, if you look, for example, at people in the polar belt who eat lots of fish oil and you compare them with, say, people in Scotland who don't eat, eat much fish, as much fish oil. I mean, they eat 
fish and chips. That's deep fried in lard. <laughs> but um, if you, my wife is from England, so I'm like just ribbing her a little bit here. But 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 if if you look at that, um, so there's this, there's clear a clear epidemiological um, relationship between fish oil consumption and cardiovascular cardiovascular mortality. It turns out if you actually eat it in fish, it's better than taking it in a capsule. People have done studies looking at that. Not quite sure why. Presumably there are other things in the fish that might, that, that might help, except not that fish has mercury, so it's like, you know, what do you do? Um, and, and, and also that if you look, for example, at high levels of um, fish oil consumption, it actually increases insulin sensitivity, so you're less likely to become insulin resistant. So there are multiple benefits. I, mean, I take fish oil as well for that reason. Yes? So the question is, is there a direct correlation between insulin use and kidney damage? So that's, that's a tricky question. So I'm going to answer it in this way. Um, if you have type 1 diabetes, um, you really can only be treated with, with insulin. If you have type tight glucose control, your risk of kidney failure goes down. If you have type 2 diabetes, the relationship between type 2 diabetes and renal failure is more complex because it's not only related to glucose, which clearly is important, but also related to lipids. I would say that in general terms, if you're trying to prevent kidney disease, you should really maximize your glucose control. The heart is a little bit different. And, and again, a lot of what I said in terms of heart failure and diabetes occurs after you've gotten the first punch, right? So now if you've gotten your first injury or your first insult and the heart is beginning to kind of weaken then that's where the insulin potentially can be having a, a relatively adverse effect in that particular context. Any other question, Brooks? Just, if I recall my Krebs cycle, every yes. glucose molecule is losing 32 HCG. Correct. Like that. So you're showing that it, it obviously goes down mm -hmm. the deficiency of the glucose. But on the mitochondria, as we age, typically mitochondria become fewer as, as well. So is that Right. So the question is, does diabetes reduce the number of mitochondria? The answer is yes, but it's really more of a qualitative thing, right? Um, depending on the model, you may actually see an increase in mitochondrial volume density if you, for example, do stere your stereology and you actually look at the mitochondrial volume. But if you look, for example, at the density of Christy, if you look at the content of the enzymes, they are invariably lower. So it's not just a matter of fewer mitochondria, but it's just n less healthy mitochondria as a consequence of that. Of yes. Of course, and, and I blew through that very quickly, but clearly there's you know, reasonably strong evidence that um, in high-risk patients with diabetes, a baby aspirin is of value in reducing or mitigating the risk of a subsequent event. So let's uh, give Dr. Abel a wonderful round of applause. Well, I knew I knew when this uh, topic came up that I was not going to enjoy this evening's dinner. <laughs> Little did I know that tomorrow morning I've got to go out and run with Dr. Jackson. <laughs> In the rain, hopefully not the sleet, and on top of that, I have to pickle my brain for the next few weeks. So, uh, a magnificent talk. For all of you that would like to join us, we'll have a reception downstairs in the lobby, uh, commencing as soon as we can get down there. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. It's fascinating.